Hello everyone, I'm Heather Rose. I write for adults, but I also write a children's series. And today I'm going to read chapter one of the first in the series called Finding Serendipity. These books are for ages eight to 12, or maybe a more adventurous seven-year-old if you were to read them to them. And there are three books in this series. As you'll see, the name on these books is Angelica Banks, which is the pen name of me and my fellow author, Daniel Wood. We write these books together. So the first is Finding Serendipity. We'll read chapter one in a moment. The second is A Week Without Tuesday. And the third is Blueberry Pancakes Forever. But if you're an American reader, you'll know that the books actually look like this in America and they look different again in Germany. And the books in America are illustrated, so I'll show you some of those drawings as we go along. But let's start with chapter one of Finding Serendipity. I'm doing this reading of our books uh, to help parents in isolation because it's very, very intense being home with your primary age readers. So every day at four o'clock, we're doing this as often as we can in the next few week, month, weeks and months of isolation. So, Finding Serendipity, I'm going to read from the Australian edition, and the dedication reads to Baffix, Every Day is Magic, B-A-F-F-I-X, Every Day is Magic, and in memory of Axel Rooney, Best of All Dogs. Chapter 1. Goodbye, school shoes, said Tuesday McGillicuddy, dropping her battered black lace-ups into a bin full of lunch wraps and orange peel. It was the end of school for the day, for the week, for the year. By the time school started again in eight whole weeks, even if those old shoes could be mended, Tuesday would have grown right out of them. From her bag, Tuesday took her beloved emerald green roller shoes, slipped her feet into them and firmly tied the laces. Then she hoiked her bag onto her back and coasted gleefully out the school gate, her gingery blonde plaits drifting behind her. Tuesday was reasonably tall for her age and fast on her roller shoes. She zipped to the end of the street, turned left, carefully crossed a road and glided into the leafy shade of City Park. Waiting for her by the fountain as usual was her dog Baxter with a double R. Baxter was a smallish dog with a whiskery face and shaggy hair in every conceivable shade of brown. He trotted towards Tuesday, holding his lead in his mouth and waving the hairy curtain of his tail in greeting. Baxter didn't need a lead, of course, but he didn't mind pretending if it helped keep Tuesday out of trouble with the city park officials, who were fussy about dog leads and litter and bicycles. Tuesday took Baxter's lead and together they turned in the direction of home. Hang on a minute, doggo, there's something I need to do first, Tuesday said. Rummaging in the compartments of her school bag, she found two coins, one gold and one silver. Although the gold one was bigger and worth more, Tuesday felt certain that it was the silver one she should use. Wishes were silvery things, maybe because wishes rhymed with fishes. Tuesday held the silver coin tightly in her hand as if she could somehow squeeze her wish into it. Then she solemnly cast it into the fountain where it plinked into the water. Baxter put his paws up on the stony rim of the fountain to watch. And all the while, Tuesday, with eyes scrunched and fists clenched, wished. Please, please, please. Finally, the coin settled on the smooth tiles at the bottom of the fountain next to all the other wishes that lay there. Baxter pricked up his coarse furred ears and looked at Tuesday quizzically. Tuesday looked deeply into her dog's golden brown eyes. In the mirror of his pupils, she could see two images of a girl with slightly messy plaits, blue green eyes, and eyebrows that had a tendency to scrunch together in puzzlement whenever she was thinking hard, which she often was. Come on, Baxter, you know wishes don't come true if you tell, Tuesday said. Please, she had wished, please, please, oh, please let today be the day that she finishes the book. It was a year since Serendipity Smith's latest book, Vivian Small and the Mountains of Margolov, had been published. And on that extraordinary day, queues of excited readers had snaked out of the doors of the bookshops of the world. 
There were children lined up along streets, around city blocks, down the middle of shopping centres and out into car parks. A year later, almost everyone had read Vivian Small in the mountains of Margolov and many knew the story by heart. Almost all the copies of Vivian Small in the mountains of Margolov were tatty and torn with loving and everyone was desperate to know what would happen to Vivian Small next. Tuesday McGillicuddy loved Vivian Small and her adventures as much as the next person. She couldn't wait to have her very own copy of Serendipity Smith's new book, which was going to be called Vivian Small and the Final Battle. She would snuggle down to read it under her bed covers by torchlight. As much as anyone else in the world, Tuesday wanted to know where Vivian would go and what would happen to her when she got there and in what kinds of ingenious ways she would outsmart her arch rival, the monstrous Carsten Mothwood. But that wasn't the only reason or even the main reason that Tuesday wished Serendipity Smith would finish her book today. The reason that Tuesday hoped Serendipity Smith would finish her book was that as well as being the most famous writer in the world, Serendipity Smith was Tuesday's mother. Being such a famous writer meant that Serendipity Smith had a diary that was full of appointments written in pencil, blue pen, black pen and even red pen, all made for her by her assistant, Miss Digby. These appointments were for Serendipity to read in bookshops and appear on talk shows and visit libraries and do radio interviews and make audio recordings of her books. There were appointments for book signings, school visits, meetings with important people, festival launches and art shows. When Serendipity Smith wasn't busy keeping all these appointments, she was busy writing the next Vivian Small book. But when Serendipity Smith finished Vivian Small in the final battle, she would for a short time, at least until she began a new book, just be Tuesday's mother. Miss Digby would defer all the appointments and Serendipity would close the door to her writing room and take a holiday with Tuesday and Tuesday's father and Baxter and nothing would disturb them. Having made her wish, Tuesday took hold of Baxter's lead and walked to the edge of City Park, then lifted the toes of her roller shoes and let Baxter tow her all the way home. He galloped along with the wind ruffling his short, shaggy coat, his ears pricked, his grin wired, and Tuesday laughing behind him. For a small dog, Baxter was very strong, and he loved to pull Tuesday along on her roller shoes. Now, because you are very good at spelling, you might have been wondering why Baxter has two R's at the end of his name, not just one. Well, it's like this. Baxter, with a double R, was unfailingly good-natured. He never snapped at small children, he never bounded up to strangers, he had never, ever knocked anyone over, and he never had to be told, down. He did not bark if someone was passing by the fence. He did not chew shoes or dribble on school bags. He did not pester Tuesday to play fetch with him every time they went to the park, though he was very fond of catching a frisbee thrown to him on a glorious blue sky day, and could leap higher than you would have imagined possible for a dog his size. It was true that he did eat rather noisily and often, but he never made bad smells or noises afterwards. Baxter was a thoughtful dog. He considered it his job to collect the mail and the papers when they were posted through the slot in the front door, and he had a way of knowing which letters were for serendipity and which were for Tuesday's father, Dennis. Baxter deposited serendipity's mail quietly outside the door of her writing room and left Dennis's on the kitchen table. On the rare occasion when Tuesday received a letter, this didn't happen nearly often enough for Tuesday, he would place it on the hall table so Tuesday could see it the moment she arrived home from school. Baxter was the best and most civilised of dogs. But if he ever encountered a person or animal who scared a child, as a large dog had done to Tuesday on her way to school one morning, or a potential thief, such as the la strange lady in a blue coat who had been prowling around Tuesday's scooter one afternoon when she left it outside a shop, then Baxter would growl in earnest. Urgh, he would say. Urgh. His serious growl was not a noise that was pleasant to hear. It made people get the sort of goosebumps they get if they see a very large spider on the wall behind them. 
So that is why Baxter had a double R at the end of his name. Because although he looked like the kindest, friendliest dog in the world, his growl could be very frightening when he wanted it to be. Baxter had a heart full of courage and he felt that his most important job was to protect the people that he loved. Home for Tuesday and Baxter was a tall brown house on Brown Street. It was the tallest house on the street and also the narrowest, but this suited Tuesday and her parents. After all, as they would sometimes remind one another, the most important thing about a house was not how big it was, but how many stories it had. As usual, Tuesday's father was in the tall brown house on Brown Street, waiting for her to arrive home from school. While his wife was incredibly famous, Dennis McGillicuddy was not famous at all, and that was precisely the way he liked it. Dennis McGillicuddy had dark, kind eyes and large, leaf-shaped ears. The top of his head was perfectly smooth, and the remaining hair that grew low on the back of his head and behind his ears was very short and bristly. His eyebrows and moustache were both dark. The moustache was neat and tidy, but his eyebrows were prone to growing wild, and Dennis often said that one morning he might awake to find birds nesting in them. For reading, Dennis wore large, round, dark-framed glasses, and every day, except on Wednesdays and holidays, he wore a tie. Dennis's ties were of every colour and pattern, and his habit of dressing every day in a crisp shirt and tie was left over, he said, from years earlier, when he ran a fancy restaurant. But now he ran the tall brown house on Brown Street. He was the oil in the hinges and the battery in the clock. He was the one who made everything run smoothly and the one who made everything tick. He made breakfast, lunch, dinner and phone calls. He put the school notices on the fridge and made all the appointments for dentists, new school shoes and trips to the theatre. He made polka dot brownies, a tray of which was just coming out of the oven as Tuesday rolled on her heels down the hallway and twirled to a stop at the kitchen table. Ah, oh, my seashell, I smell the scent of a summer sojourn said Dennis with a kiss to the top of Tuesday's head. Tuesday's father had a way with words. He could make almost any sentence sound exciting and wonderful, even if it was an observation about homework. I must remark upon the mark from Miss Misselthwaite in mathematics, he'd once said mildly, peering across the table at Tuesday, who was trying not to look embarrassed. There's no maths a McGillicuddy cannot master, Dennis had said. The trick is sometimes to go slower, not faster. And Tuesday had smiled and felt better about her poor results in long division. Tuesday looked at her dad with a glint in her eyes. A summer sojourn? Dad, are we going to the beach for the holidays? Has she finished it? Then Tuesday noticed that Dennis had set the kitchen table for three, or four if you counted the dish beneath the table that had been set down for Baxter. You think she'll finish today? Don't you, Dad, you think she'll finish? Completion is conceivable, but cruelly uncertain. I can report, however, that when I ascended the staircase at lunchtime, the stack of pages on the finish side of the desk was this thick, he said, holding two of his fingers a long way apart. Dennis cut the hot brownies into large gooey squares. He arranged them on a plate in the middle of the table and slid a turkey mince cupcake onto the plate beneath the table. Half a heartbeat later, Baxter had wolfed his treat in a single swallow. Go on then, Dennis said to Tuesday, gesturing at the brownies. I think I'll wait for Mum, said Tuesday. Good idea, said Dennis. So Tuesday and her father sat at the table and sipped their tea and played a game of cribbage, a card game that had a little board and matchsticks to count the points. Baxter lay beneath the table and dozed, although one of his ears was pricked up in the direction of the staircase, waiting for the sound of descending footsteps. The room in which Serendipity Smith wrote her books was on the top story of the tall brown house. It had highly polished honey coloured floorboards and bookshelves lining all the walls. Books were crammed into the shelves upways and sideways and in no particular order. Well, not one that Tuesday could work out. The only other items in Serendipity Smith's writing room were a desk two chairs, one an upright chair for writing in and the other a deeply comfortable red velvet chair for reading in. A lamp with red glass beads dripping around the bottom of the shade and an old-fashioned typewriter which made a reassuring ding every time serendipity reached the end of the line. Tuesday had learned that writing was sometimes 
a very quiet business. There were long hours when no noise at all came from the inside of her mother's writing room and Tuesday imagined these were the times when her mother sat very still, curled in her red velvet chair, thinking and imagining her stories into being. And there were other times when Tuesday would hear her mother's typewriter going click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, ding. On those rare and fabulous days when a book was completed, Serendipity would race down the stairs and come skipping into the kitchen. She'd kiss Tuesday's father smack on the lips and catch Tuesday up in her arms and whirl her around and say, Whee! I finished! That night, over dinner, instead of saying, Hmm, when Tuesday and Dennis, or Dennis said, Please pass the sauce, she would sing a song all about sauce, of course, delivered by a horse with unnecessary force on a long race course. Or she would play the spoons on the tabletop, rattling out a tinny melody with Tuesday on the glassware and Dennis on the salt and pepper grinders, the three of them making clicking noises with their tongues in their cheeks, just like a normal family. And that was just the beginning, because then there was the holiday. Not a very long holiday, mind, because when readers all over the world are waiting for your stories to be written, you can't let them down. But the weeks after Serendipity finished a book and took a holiday with Tuesday and Dennis and Baxter were the most wonderful weeks Tuesday could remember in her whole life. Sitting at the kitchen table, Tuesday wondered what her mother and father had planned for this holiday. A summer sojourn, her father had said. Perhaps that meant the beach, but it might equally mean walking in the mountains or sailing on a yacht, which Tuesday had never tried, although she dearly wanted to. Or it might mean a tropical island with palm trees and a long white sandy beach and a little house with a thatched roof. Tuesday took a deep and hopeful breath. Her father looked up and smiled and Baxter gave a little rough as if he approved of all this daydreaming. But still no sound came from upstairs and the brownies grew cool on the plate. After they'd played two games of cribbage plus a game of snap, Tuesday fetched her book and settled into the window seat in the kitchen. Dennis brought her a brownie on a plate and then sat at the kitchen table with his crossword, asking Tuesday for help as he went along. While they deliberated over 11 down and 23 across, Baxter snored. Outside the kitchen window, the day turned from afternoon to twilight. The hands on the kitchen clock made one slow, slow circle and then another. At seven o'clock, Dennis made his special cheese on ham on more cheese toast with tomato relish. And though it was one of Tuesday's favourite meals, she didn't enjoy it as much as usual. All the waiting had made the fizzing excitement inside of her go flat, just as if she were a glass of lemonade left for too long on the bench. As Tuesday washed up and Dennis dried and put the plates and cups away, he looked at his daughter with fond concern. How about a couplet or two, he said, tweaking one of Tuesday's plats lightly. Hmm? His eyes twinkled as he said, in a wonderfully theatrical voice. The butter from Dorothy's crumpet dripped into the bell of her trumpet. Ordinarily, this would have Tuesday replying with a couplet of her own. Sweet young Edgar, eating jello, dropped a spoonful onto his cello. But tonight, her heart just wasn't in it. It's no good, Dad, she said. I can't think about anything but Mum. Do you think she's ever coming down? It is getting late, her father agreed. Why don't you tootle on upstairs and have a listen outside her door? So Tuesday kicked off her roller shoes and tiptoed quietly up the stairs to the landing outside her mother's writing room and Baxter followed. Tuesday put her ear against the solid timber of the door and Baxter did the same. There they stood for quite some time until they were certain that what they could hear inside was absolutely nothing. Then Tuesday did hear a sound it was a creaking kind of sound, nothing like the click, 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 ding of her mother's typewriter. She listened harder. Creak, creak. Perhaps her mother was pacing the floor. Perhaps she was trying to figure out the very, very last sentence of Vivian Small in the final battle. Tuesday wondered if she should go in. Perhaps she could help. It couldn't be much harder than figuring out the answer to 23 across. Suddenly the creaking got louder and Tuesday realised it was the sound of her father climbing the stairs behind her. Well, Dennis asked. Nothing. I can't hear a thing, Tuesday told him dejectedly. 
Odd, her father said, looking up through a skylight in the ceiling into an evening sky spotted with stars. Dennis put his own ear to the door. Hearing nothing, he knocked lightly. Serendipity, he called. There was no answer. Serendipity? This time he called a little louder. Mom, called Tuesday. Woof, barked Baxter. Nothing, no reply, no sound at all. I think, Dennis said to Tuesday, that there is only one thing for it. He turned the handle of the door and carefully pushed it open. In the room with the honey-coloured floorboards and shelves, in which all the books were piled higgledy-piggledy, was a desk, two chairs, a lamp, a typewriter and a window that stretched almost to the ceiling. The window was wide open and Serendipity Smith was nowhere to be seen. And that is the end of chapter one. And I'm going to show you a beautiful illustration in the American edition that Stevie Lewis, the wonderful illustrator who also illustrated some of the How to Train a Dragon series, illustrated for our book here. And there is the window open. The window is open and Tuesday and Dennis can see a chair and the desk and the typewriter, but just the starry night beyond. So if you would like to join me tomorrow for another episode of Finding Serendipity, we'll start with chapter two then. Bye for now.